Joining us this morning is uh, uh, Bruce Blair, uh, who is with ACMC. And um, welcome, Bruce. How you doing? I'm doing fine. Good. Uh, you are a speech therapist. Yes. And I, I understand that you are new to this area. Yeah, I actually moved away. F I grew up in Madison, graduated from Madison High School. Mm -hmm. That was a while ago. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I moved away. We lived in uh, Northwest Ohio. Okay. We lived in Michigan. For the last 14 years, I've lived in Kingston, New York, which is Hudson Valley. Yeah. And I worked in a hospital there in Poughkeepsie. Yeah. And then uh, about four months ago, I moved back. Now I live in Geneva. Really? Yeah, which, of course, when I left, I graduated from Madison, so Geneva was kind of the enemy. But right, 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 <laughs> right. But now, you know, it's a nice town. I like it. Did you... Um Want to come back to this area then? Is that, is yeah, that? we've had, well, my wife's had family here. Uh, my family's gone, uh, moved away to different places. Uh -huh. um, but we've always kept in touch. And, I, you know, I like the area. I think we always never really got Lake Erie out of our blood. You know, that happens. It happens yeah. with me, too. I mean, I've had opportunities to move on. And it was like, I don't know, you know, I, I love it here. I love this area. I like the rural environment that we have. And, uh, of course, my family some of my family's still here, so you kind of need to move away. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I love this area. I really do. It's a beautiful area, and uh, it's developing a lot, all the wineries. And yeah, yeah, yeah a, lot of, a lot of music. I find I say coffee funny, though, <laughs> which I didn't know when I lived there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. you picked up a little bit of an accent there. Yeah, but you know what I what I didn't lose is probably, you know, being a speech therapist, I listen to this kind of stuff. Right. Um, if you live along the lake, you probably don't say probably. You usually say probably. Yeah, you're exactly right. You drop off and off. You're you exactly know. right. Yeah. yeah. In, in a while. Yeah. Well, I'll see you in a while. Mm -hmm. uh, I would hear that when I lived in New York because no one else did. Yeah. You have to move out of your own dialect area to hear your own dialect. Well, I had a person that moved, uh, that came up to visit from the south. I thought she had an accent, and she said we have an accent. Well, so course, you, yeah. you know, and I don't notice that because no, would, we're around it all. But the time. everyone has an accent. Everybody thinks that you know God intends for everyone to speak just like I do, but it's not the case. Everybody has an accent. Right, right. It's just that you don't hear it if you grew up there. Your um, background, of course, is, uh, and we haven't had many um, people in your profession on the show to discuss this particular thing, but there are so many situations out there where a speech therapist really is needed. And um, what's one of the top priorities that you take care of as a speech therapist? Well, especially in my case, because I come from a very medical background. So what I'm always looking for is uh, swallowing problems. Really? Yeah, yeah. Speech therapist, that's the first thing I do when I walk into somebody's hospital room, though. I say, hi, I'm Bruce, I'm a speech therapist. Um, speech therapists deal with speech and language problems, but we also treat swallowing problems, because they say, I don't, there's nothing wrong with my speech. Well, that's not what we're worried about. The doctor is concerned that when they're eating, they're coughing, things are going down the wrong pipe. Mm -hmm. It is the wrong pipe, because it goes to your lungs. And you don't want to get food and liquid in your lungs, Right. Because your lungs are warm, moist, and dark. Mm -hmm. That's the perfect breeding ground for bacteria. So if you've had a stroke, or if you have Parkinson's, very common with Parkinson's, um, any kind of neurological thing, uh, multiple sclerosis, or just you know you you really don't feel well, you know because it's a complicated system. So if it's going down a little bit wrong, a little bit slow, a little bit weak, it could go into the wrong pipe, and if it builds up there, it could cause what's called aspiration pneumonia because it's going to be food in your lungs and that's... How do you treat it. that, Bruce? Well, if, you, if it's too late and you already have it, then you have to essentially you're hospitalized until your immune system can eat the food and take it out through your bloodstream. Um, the best thing to do is though is be preventative. If you're eating and every time you eat you have a tendency to do a lot of throat clearing and coughing, then you're having close calls. You're almost putting stuff into your airway. You are putting stuff in your airway. So what we would do is try and, a speech therapist would try and figure out how can we have it go down maybe a little slower. You know, I'm, I'm routinely telling my patients, you can't eat and drink like an American. You know, it's way too fast. Too much, too fast. And uh, I try and train them to do that. I'm very, very much into education. 
I pull out anatomical drawings and I say, here's how it works, because you can't see it, right. and you don't realize how complicated it is. I showed my anatomical drawings, I carry them around with me, I give them to my students, because I'm a firm believer in education when it comes to medical stuff. Right. You talk to somebody and it's some bizarre thing that you can't see, how, what, how do they know what's going on? Right. So you're not going to get compliance. You know, I, I've noticed this in uh, some people. Now, when I, I'm a very slow eater um, because I don't like the feeling of being over, overly full. Mm -hmm. But I've been out with people that devour their plate. I don't know how they do it. I mean, it, it almost seems unhealthy. Yeah. How can you, like, not breathe? Yeah, I know. Uh, you know, it's, it just seems like uh, it's not going to go away. Nobody's going to steal it from you. Just slow down. But some people yeah. are, uh, have that, like you said, eat like an American. Yeah, I'm, I'm always telling people that. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. It's risky. What about uh, uh, stroke patients? Uh, they come, of course, can lose their uh, ability to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have a procedure that uh, you try to get them back, uh, bring them back? Absolutely, but it's very, very, we try to tailor thing, things to the actual person. Um, because the human brain is awfully complicated. Mm -hmm. And if you have a stroke, you're, you're causing a lot of problems. The main, the main thing is, is that, you know, the stroke is not in a very big area. The rest of the brain is okay, but it's thrown off balance. Mm -hmm. So if you can figure out, first of all, you need to figure out, does this person understand me? Because maybe they do and maybe they don't. Right. And sometimes a person could not understand language at all, but still look like they do because they're reading your nonverbal communication, they're looking at where you look. You know, if you walk someone up to a table and there's a chair there and you say, sit down, and they sit down, that doesn't necessarily mean they understood the words. Because what do you do when you come up to a chair? You sit down. Mm -hmm. So you first establish that. What do they understand? And then secondly, what can they actually say? They might be perfectly able to understand what you want and want to say something, but for some reason or other they can't make the muscles work, or they can't remember how to say the words, or they can't remember the words they want to use. Right. So once you get that pattern down, then you might be able to come up with a channel that still works. I'm working with a patient now, an outpatient, who can write, we discovered. He can write down at least single words. If he gets to three or four words, it's too much and it breaks down. Yeah. But at least he can tell people, you know, he wants a cup of coffee or, or he has pain. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're working on speech and we're also, we have um, uh, uh, an iPad that has a speech device, you know, right. software. And we're trying to get him to be able to do that. But since he can write, I'm figuring he can probably use the keyboard. This is very portable. Maybe we can get some speech too. We'll try it. Mm -hmm. But we're always, I'm always looking for some plan B. You know, if this works good, if this doesn't work. Is his his or her or speech completely gone? Yeah, pretty much. Mm -hmm. He understands what you're saying to him, but when he tries to talk, you know, he just goes ba 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 mm -hmm. because he can't. He knows what he wants to say. He tells his mouth to do something. His mouth can't do it. I had uh, one of your cardiologists on here uh, recently. His name's John Stevens. And uh, he told me one of the most devastating things that can happen in your life is a stroke. Yes. Uh, because yeah. it's very it's hard to rebound. Yeah, it's a life changer. Mm -hmm. I, you're walking down the street minding your own business and all of a sudden half of your body doesn't work. Right, you know? right. Right. And maybe some of it will come back. Maybe it'll all come back. It's very hard to predict. Um, you mentioned uh, neurological problems, uh, um, which could be a variety of things. I would guess that uh, with the brain, like you say, it's so complex, it's hard to, to pinpoint. But um, are there procedures at the hospital that they can, like an MRI? I don't know your business, but or know that much about that per profession, but. Are there ways to detect what the problems are? If somebody comes to you and said, look, I, I've lost the sight of my eye or I've lost the ability to, to, to move, can you find that? Well, <coughs> excuse me, up to a point, and it also depends on what your focus is. Now, I'm not a doctor, I'm a therapist, mm -hmm. so, so therefore, just automatically, my focus is what can this person do and what can I do to help them do it better? Okay, now it helps a lot if the neurologist and the radiologist and the 
uh, family physician, everybody has their report, and I have access to that. Right. And I can say, oh, see, okay, okay, there's a, uh, an acute infarct in a certain place, and that's really handy. And it would make a very big difference in the medical treatment of the person. But in the long run, what I want to know is, you know, do you, can you say what this is? And if you can't, it doesn't much matter where that infarct is. Mm -hmm. What matters is, can you do it? Is there some way I can do it if I show you the picture? If I put the two pictures out, can you identify it? That's where I'm at. I'm at functional use. Okay. okay. So, yeah, and it's, it's very handy knowing where the infarct is and stuff like that. It will save you time, lead you to setting up your goals quicker. But a lot of times you don't have a lot of time. You know, in, in modern medicine, you, you walk into a, uh, a, um, a hospital room and you need to be working with that person in about 10 minutes. Really? That quick? Yeah, you don't have a lot of time. But you can do that if you've been doing it. You know, I tell my students, I, I, I don't have students here yet, but I've always had students in the past, and I, I tell them, uh, I, you know, I've been doing this since God was young. Mm -hmm. So you walk into the room and you start eliminating things pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it has it changed quite a bit, Bruce, over the years, the the, uh, the profession itself? Yeah, some things a lot. Yeah, some things a great deal. I've talked to a lot of doctors that said, you know, I started out 30 years ago or whatever, and uh, 20 years ago even, he goes, you wouldn't believe the technology changes that have been made. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. It's phenomenal. I see you use a, an iPad. Yeah. Uh, tell me about that. I the mean, iPad certainly is, how that works. Oh, the iPad is really changing speech therapy. How, how so? Well, for one thing, we use a lot of like cards and um, materials, stimulus materials, uh, sentences that we would have the person say or read or imitate. Mm -hmm. Mostly, though, pictures. And I can put that all, I have my iPad here. Right, right. Okay, I can put that all on this. And I already have enough on this that would replace um, a, a whole bookcase full of cards. Really? But more important than that are things like, if I can show you something. This is the first one I started using. Okay. Hold that up to the Thank camera. Can we zoom in on that, uh, um, Matty? See. see, I am not a great uh, computer person. But I have a, a mom, my mom is big and, and she has an iPad, she she swears by it. That's, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's really handy. No, that's showing. Oh, yeah, okay, that's it. All right, now this is really a toy, but what I do that with this is I found it very, very useful when working with people with Parkinson's disease. People with Parkinson's disease, there are three major things for the person with Parkinson's. Okay. Their speech is very rapid. They hardly move their articulators, their tongue and lips at all, so they're talking real fast, they're mm -hmm. like this. Wow. And their speech is very quiet because they don't breathe, okay? No breath control. So, if you can get this person to be louder, then neurologically you're going to deliver more electricity to your lips and jaw. So, here you are working with this person, you give them a sentence to say, and you say, okay, take a deeper breath. Okay, say it slower. Slow it down. Move your tongue more. Oh, be louder. Well, you don't have to do that. All you have to do is say, Say loud, but that's a subjective thing, isn't it? You weren't loud enough. Oh yeah, right. They don't believe that. Well, not with this, because if they're real quiet, it goes real low, a lot of ambient noise. But if they're loud enough, I'll put this halfway between us, and I'll say, "Okay, am I speaking in a pretty normal voice right now?" And they'll say, "Yeah, yeah, that's about right." Now. Okay, well, right now that's about that's hitting about 80. So now you say something. And you say something that's down there, and see, it takes all of the. You know, I don't have to be the bad guy. I can say. You didn't do it. Right. No, no, I was loud enough. And this one, you didn't hit 80. So I can really turn people around quickly with this, whereas if they were listening to me say, no, that wasn't loud enough, well, okay. If, I can't tell you how many people with Parkinson's have said over the years, oh, well, the real problem here is that my wife, husband, needs a hearing aid. You know? Oh, I'm pretty and happy. If they just got a hearing aid, then this wouldn't be a problem. Well, no, there's nothing wrong with my hearing. I had a test not too long ago. And you're not loud enough. But see, they've got to take my word for it. Right. right. This, it's you know, it's subjective. I, you know, you mentioned Parkinson, and, and uh, Muhammad Ali uh, has Parkinson's disease. Oh, yes, yes, he has a Parkinson uh, symptoms. Yes. Syndrome. They may even call it punch drunk from boxing, but yeah. he can't even talk anymore. No, probably not. 
wow, that's amazing. And here's a guy who was very articulate and very, very fast speaker, yeah. but Parkinson's, normal. But Parkinson's disease is a disease of the automatic pilot. Okay, your brain, um, it, it's an illusion. People say, people think that there's this person right behind my eyes, but that's just an illusion. Your brain is wonderful at illusions. It makes you think that there's this one person, but actually there's a committee inside your brain, of different parts of the brain, and they all have different, you know, they all have control depending on what's happening. Mm -hmm. So the automatic pilot is why when you break your watch and you're not wearing it, you still keep looking at your face. Right, right. I've right. done that. Yeah, and you move, and now all of a sudden the switch in the bathroom is on this side and it's not on this side. Yeah. But you keep going over here because the automatic pilot does that. So when that breaks down with Parkinson's, because the part of that's that's not working very well with Parkinson's is right there in the basic anglia, that's the automatic pilot. Therefore, you'll get people, many, many people have told me this over the years. I want to do it. People tell me, you know, come on, let's go to lunch. And I want to, but I can't start. They cannot turn a thought into an action, which is devastating mm -hmm. and, and subtle. Mm -hmm. So you have to really understand what's going on. The family, the staff, they have to understand what's going on. Because if they don't, they're going to think that this guy's just being a problem. Mm -hmm. And it's not how he wants to do it. But he can't get it started. He can't initiate movement. One of the, another problem that I have noticed over the years that I uh, imagine you has brought to your attention, stuttering. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a speech therapy. Uh, it, thing. When you go, you, can you, is there any way to, to, to get a person from stop stuttering? Well, you could go to Stockholm and collect your Nobel Prize if you could figure that uh, out. You know? yeah. And it's difficult, and it's actually not, it's not all that difficult to get a person fluent. The hard thing is to keep them fluent. It's, and still no one really knows for sure, although more and more research is starting to think that it's, uh, one of the problems is, the left hemisphere of the brain is supposed to be the one that talks. Okay? The right hemisphere is not supposed to do that. It adds different things like tone of voice. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the theories, although I don't know if this is true, says that the right hemisphere is trying to talk too. So it's almost like having a car that has two steering wheels, you know, two people. One's trying to go this way, one's trying to go that way, and you get stasis. Mm -hmm. So, and a lot of times though, if you can teach the person to like talk on purpose, okay? Get control and go forward and also uh, breathe a little bit because this is a very frightening thing. It's an extremely difficult thing for a person who stutters to be sitting there and suddenly the phone rings. You know, because now all of a sudden, oh my God, I'm on. And it's very hard. There's a, a lot of performance pressure on a person who stutters. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very difficult thing. It's very high on my list of things that I, you know, kind of hope never happens to me. It can, there are people who have a stroke who have a condition that's very similar to stuttering. It's not stuttering, but their speech then starts to break up like that. It's really? very, very similar, yeah. a broke aphasia. I, I had a guy tell me one time that when he, he went to a therapist years ago mm -hmm. and was taught to, I thought it was either count backwards or count forward to 10 and it kind of slowed down that thing that you were saying goes from one side to the steering wheel type thing. And I don't know if it ever worked, but that's what he was told. He was was taught. And now let's go uh, back there yeah, some years. Yeah, I've never heard that one. But the funny thing is, is that when I, you know, everybody was saying, "What do you mean you haven't seen the King's speech? Are you crazy?" You know. So I finally went and saw the King's speech. You know, and uh, ironically, although some of the stuff he was doing was a little wacky, at the same time, you know, that made a lot of sense. I never got through that movie. Oh, I, I, I DVR'd it, but I never got to watch it. As it turned out, it was really interesting to me. I've had people say it's an excellent movie. An excellent movie, yeah. Yeah, he had a stuttering problem. Yeah, a very severe one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what about lisping? You know, a lot of times you see kids, little kids, now maybe they outgrow it, but... Yeah, some, some do. And there's, I've seen older people with it, and then they have an outgrow in it. Yeah, and that happens too. Um, that's... The, there are speech therapists all over the world who are, you know, treating kids who are, I don't know, maybe eight or nine who are still listening. Mm -hmm. It's not unusual for someone who's five to not be able to say S very well or L because it's an extremely complicated thing to do. Mm -hmm. See, nobody ever really thinks about what does it actually take to talk because you learn when you were two. You don't right. remember that. Right. Okay. Well, if you have 
time for this? I want to give you a demonstration. Yeah. Okay. Say cat. Cat. I do this routinely with my stroke patients as well as with the parents of uh, kids, articulation patients. Okay. Well, how do you say cat? You ever really thought about that? It's not magic. You have to, you have to do something because human beings are made of pulleys, levers, and cables. Okay. We are. We're mechanical. Okay. So, here's the roof of your mouth. Mm -hmm. Here's your teeth. Mm -hmm. Here's your tongue. And when you say for cat, that's a K sound. It looks like a C, but it's a K. The back of the tongue jumps up, seals off the whole air tract, builds up air pressure, and explodes it out. Okay? And if it doesn't, it's not a K. So there's an explosion. It's called in phonetics a plosive sound because it's explosive. Now T is almost exactly the same thing, except it's the tip of the tongue. The tip of the tongue jumps up behind the teeth, flattens out, seals off the whole airway, builds up air pressure, and explodes it out. Now, there's not much difference between those two, but the human brain is pretty sophisticated, mm -hmm. and you know I didn't say tag. Mm -hmm. Now, ah, ah, okay, that's a vowel. Vowels are different. I know your school teacher always said vowels. Vowels are different. Here's why. The vowel is how high is your tongue in relation to your palate. So if your tongue goes real high up close to your palate, that's E. And in order to say ah, you got to get your jaw out of the way. Mm -hmm. To drop it far enough. So this, I would say to you, is a uh, slight trombone. Ah, yeah, anywhere between there. If you stop, you have some sort of human vowel. Mm. Now, ah is about the middle and a little higher. So, ah, that's how you say cat. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that exactly, you're, it's not that work. Mm -hmm. Now, T, that's easy. L is not so bad because there's a place to hit. You know, okay. I know I hit the T. I know I did it right, because not only do I hear it, but I feel it. You don't feel R. You pull your tongue back, you curl up the tip, and you're kind of suspended in the air to say, grr. Wow. Some kids don't pick that up. Mm -hmm. Often kids who are a little bit, um, oh, like have a little bit of an immature uh, motor system, has, has nothing to do necessarily with cognition. But the motor system is, they probably wouldn't do well on a balance beam. They might be the kids who walk through the doorway and they bump into the side once in a while. And they also don't speak very distinctly because they just don't have that kind of fine motor movement. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, you know, it's a matter of teaching them how to do it, where to put it, where to put the tongue in, stuff like that. I remember, I think I've mentioned this before on the show, but I remember as a little kid in the first grade, um, I could not say spaghetti. I said spaghetti. <laughs> and so the, the SP would not work on me. Yeah. And I remember my first grade teacher, and I remember this, this yeah. was many, many years ago, she actually trying to teach me how to say spaghetti. Yeah. Yeah. So it was the, the SP type thing, I guess. I don't know. Spaghetti is one of those ones that's real famous. Yeah. Is it really? Oh, yeah. Everybody, very few people for some reason. They're always, if you went out randomly, picked. 20 people off the street, there's going to be a couple of them who can't say spaghetti. Is that right? Yeah. I, but the spaghetti is what they're going to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Think about it, okay, it's a butt. See, they have to take it off automatic pilot. Think about, okay, how do I actually say this? Spaghetti. And then they can say it. But a lot of what I do in, in swallowing and speech and language is take the body off of automatic pilot, put it in manual override, and do it on purpose and do it right. And then do that enough so that that becomes the new automatic pilot. My my mentor, Mike Grassetter in college, uh, was my uh, thesis advisor also. He said, the way you learn, here's how the brain works. You're walking through the woods and you come onto a meadow. And you walk across that meadow one time. No one would ever know you were there. But you walk that pathway five times, there's a very faint pathway. Now you walk that pathway 5,000 times. There's a distinct pathway. That's how the brain works. So I told my patients, okay, well, you said it, you did it, you did it right. Okay, let's do it 5,000 times. Oh, you know? yeah. And then, and then it's easy. Success stories. Um, have you had a lot of success stories? I've had quite a few. Yeah, it's kind of can feel good. It's, yeah, it's why people get into this kind of business. I think. Yeah. You don't do it for the money. I mean, I'm comfortable, but yeah. you don't do it for the money. Right. Go to accounting or something like that. Right. Or law. But not this. It's a very good feeling to see somebody do something they couldn't do before. 
Yeah. Do you? I have a sense that you probably are the type of person that is a good coach that that uh, you give them hope and, and uh, a chance to um, better themselves by repeating and going over and over again the the process. Uh, it was probably. To me, it would be frustrating because I, you know, I, I don't like to repeat things over and over again. But uh, I imagine in this case, you have to do that. Yes, you do. Yeah, you do because it's the only way to do it. Patience. Yes. Yeah. Well, although that's a funny thing that you bring that up because people say, "Gee, you must really be a patient person," but I'm really not a very patient mm -hmm. person mm -hmm. at all. I'm not either. Mm -hmm. you know? But on the other hand, you know, if I'm really focused on it, I'm working real hard. Sometimes I'm working the hardest. When I'm not actually doing anything, I'm waiting for the person to do something, mm -hmm. and and I really, you know, and you don't want to jump in and do something for them because that's not therapy. Right, right. But if you're too patient, then your patients never get better, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, because I push people, you know, I mean, make them work. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, the what really helps, I think, get the patient focused and start working is, you know, to know for one thing, other people have gone through this too. Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, especially in the hospital, you, you work with a person for a little while, and you can tell them, "Here's what's going on." And oh, by the way, this has a name. You know, because it's the old thing about if you have a name for the dragon, it's not quite so scary. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, people have done this before. It's called apraxia. This is the problem. Other people have had it. You know, we'll work on it. And we'll see if we can make it better. Um, just knowing that they're not the first person who's gone through all this sometimes right. is really helpful. So obviously, you not being a doctor, doctors refer patients to you, yes. right? Yeah. That's how that works. Yeah. And uh, being rather rather new here, um, have you been pretty busy? The, we're building the caseload back up rapidly. Yeah. 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 Are you the only one that does this? I'm the only outpatient therapist. There okay. is another person, Renee, who uh, does outpatient or not outpatient, but home health. Okay. And we both work at the hospital. So you could run it into a grenade there. Okay. We both do uh, modified barium swallows also. That's a that's an interesting. Thing. What's that? Uh, modified barium swallow is a joint procedure where the speech therapist and the radiologist do this together in the radiology suit in fluoroscopy. Okay. So essentially, what we do is we bring the patient in. We can do this outpatient as well as inpatient. We bring the patient into the into the fluoroscopy suite. And then we feed them food that has a um, little bit of barium mixed in with it. Now, barium stops x-rays, so the x-ray gets stopped, and then you can see it. If we gave you applesauce that had nothing in it, we would see the movement of the muscles, but we wouldn't see anything else. Okay. We wouldn't see the food. Well, this way we can see where it goes. You can see the actual food as it goes down, whether it goes in the right pipe or the wrong pipe. And then we can say, okay, well, I'll tell you what, let's do a smaller one, let's do something thicker, slow it down, and you can, you can adjust things and end up with a way that this person can eat or drink and not have a problem. Um, I always tell my patients, you can, you'll be able to tell people you had your head exam and see, because we can, we can see right through it and see the food. Um, but, and it's, by the way, there's, we have a very good radiology department here. Very impressed with them. They, they work really well. Good. So Good. I'm, I'm pleased to do that because it's a little out of our territory in, right. in terms of you know the radiology department. Uh -huh. We're going into their world in order to do this procedure. Right. So, but I've uh, they've been very nice. Good. Good. You, you hear about this a lot, Bruce, um, especially with singers, and uh, that's the nodules you get in the your oh, yeah. throat. Yeah. Um, is that from straining? Is that from singing too hard or too often? Often, yeah. really? often. breathing badly. Um, the the thing about not yeah, you're talking about vocal nodules. Yeah, that's the most common voice problem. Um, if you if you work hard, you I play guitar, so I've got calluses on right. my fingertips. Well, if you do the vocal cords wrong. And you're really slamming them, those they're little tiny things, little tiny muscles, really? and you're slamming them together, you're going to get calluses. Uh -huh. That's what vocal nodules are. Okay. Calluses on the vocal cord. Is that what that and there is exactly that. what it is. Now, the problem is, now, I know people who are like, they're, they're very relaxed and they're very dramatic, and, you know, and they can yell and squeak and do all kinds of stuff. Right. They will never have problems with it. Other people, though, um, are, 
tend to be kind of controlled anyway and tight and they're not really breathing very well in the first place mm -hmm. and if they're singers and they're not warming up they're asking for trouble really but the, probably the most common person that you end up seeing in a voice uh, as a voice patient is a teacher really yeah yeah and that's devastating to teaching because you could like you know is that because they talk all day long all day long and if you're not breathing okay if you need to be loud and you are a tighter controlled person uh -huh. okay, then a lot of times what people do will they'll, they'll crunch down the vocal cords and they'll push it out okay to be louder when what you really need to do is you need to take a deep breath and lift it out and be loud like that okay but I'm, but I'm a singer, you know, and a speech therapist. Mm -hmm. It would be very embarrassing for me to show up for speech therapy because I had nodules. I mean, you know, let's face it. I could ask you this. I'm, yeah. a, I'm a guitar player too, but okay. I haven't played for a while because I've, I've, I've lost the calluses, and I'll tell you, it hurts. It hurts. Yeah. It hurts. But uh, so, what do you play? Acoustic or electric? Yeah, yeah. acoustic. Yeah, I play acoustic guitar. It's like a little stuff. bit of everything. Yeah. Uh, I'm a singer who plays the guitar, but yeah. I've been doing it for a long time. So yeah, me too. It's, uh, I love to sing. Yeah, I, I do too. I'm not that good at it, but I, I enjoy messing around with it. Well, I give a lot of free advice when people at the open mic find out I'm a speech. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I sit there and I'll cringe when I see somebody who's like, you know, straining for that high note. And yeah. Stuff like that. yeah. I'm thinking, well, I'm going to see this person professionally. Yeah. yeah. They do this a lot. Good. But if, if, if you're a, a singer, now in New York, we used to, you know, run into the occasional professional singer. You know. um, if they develop calluses because they're not, you know, using the machine right, this is a, a very complicated musical instrument. Mm -hmm. And if they're not doing it right, then you're going to be laying people off. They're a small business. You know? mm -hmm. There is a speech therapist in New York City who teaches punk singers how to scream. Right? Right. Yeah, and how to do it so that they're doing the least amount of damage because they have to scream. Yeah, that's what their fans are expecting. Well, there's there's a difference between singers and screamers, and there's yeah. they're, they're the most a lot of rock singers are really screamers yeah. and singers. Yeah, um, and it's it's expected of you, so you have to learn how to do it so you're doing the least amount of damage. Okay, I didn't, and they didn't, do that. I didn't realize that they have specials. <laughs> and, absolutely, you can do that. Um, you know, you've probably heard of Rachel Ray, the yeah cooking girl. Right. Yes, right. exactly. About three or four years ago, I was, used to watch Rachel Ray when she first started out, and I, and I noticed that uh, her voice was getting kind of gravelly. Uh -huh. And apparently, she was having these nodule problems and had to have surgery on them. I think she's okay now, but yeah. there was a time when she actually sounded really hard to hard to watch. You know, yeah, exactly. You know, I don't know if that's from talking too much or if that just—it's not talking too much. It's talking inefficiently. No. Okay. Okay. So. The, uh, once again, human beings are made of pulleys, levers, and cables, okay? So, you take a deep breath, and you start to talk, and there's no effort involved at all, because until you hit a certain point, like right there, now my body is no longer squeezing the air out. Mm -hmm. Now, I actually have to push it out, okay? Mm -hmm. So, when I actually have to start to force it, then I'm putting pressure on the vocal cords. Now, if you are that controlled person who doesn't actually take the breath first of all you're going to wear yourself out you know at the end of the teaching mm -hmm. or at the end of you know being on television and talking and, mm -hmm. and that's a very stressful thing anyway so you have people who are tense on top of it um, then you're forcing a situation where probably about a third of the way from the front that's where the vocal cords first hit and that's where you're going to get the nodules. Mm -hmm. Now, having a nodule on the vocal cord is kind of like taking a guitar string and putting a little clamp on it. It's not going to vibrate very well. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get that real low kind of voice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the vocal fry, which you know a lot of teenage girls are trying to affect nowadays. <laughs> that, uh, get that guy out of mm -hmm. your voice, but that's you know you can get away with it if you do it a little bit. But if you were if you if you're Rachel Ray, you're going to have trouble if you're not if you're not breathing. It's Kind of thing. I teach a lot of people how to breathe. You know, here's another case. I don't mean to bring up names, but, but he's a well-known celebrity in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. His name's Dick Goddard. He's a weatherman. Oh, sure. Yeah. And you Dick Goddard was weatherman tail eight, I think, wasn't it? He still is. Yeah. yeah. When, when I left. And yeah, he's still there. He's I like in his eighties. I know. I moved back there. Holy smokes, that's Dick Goddard. You know, you know, I remember him as a little boy watching him in the in the early sixties. 
when he was a young man, basically, then. Yeah. He was, well, he's probably in his 30s or late 20s, but they go, this guy is still working. I know, well, and he's like Dick Clark, too, because he hasn't changed. Yeah, he yeah, hasn't looks, changed. Still looks pretty, very <laughs> good. Uh, <laughs> what is amazing, Dick Goddard, about uh, three or four months ago, had uh, knee surgery or hip surgery, I can't remember what it was. He was off for quite some time. He has come back to work. Mm -hmm. But you know what? He has lost Bruce. Is the strength in his voice. He has a very he had a very yeah. booming voice. Now it's almost old sounding and weak. Yeah. Could surgery do that or is it did it take its toll on him? I mean he He probably of course I'm guessing because I don't I, yeah. I'm doing you know, diagnosis yeah. from a distance. Here. Right. But it's actually not that unusual. I have a patient now who, uh, until she had hip surgery, it wasn't so bad. You know, mm -hmm. and it's not. She has had a lot of pain. Right. Vocal cords. It's, it's very it's very important to understand what vocal cords are for. Okay. People think they're for speech, but they're not. No. So that's way down the line. Number one, vocal cords are for choking, protecting your airway. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's number one. Number two, though, is leverage. Okay, your your chest is hinged, and if you want to pick up something heavy, you have to stop your chest from collapsing. So, you know, I try to lift, you know, and I close my vocal cords, so I have leverage. Uh -huh. I'm trying to paint this patch over here, and I'm leaning way over. Uh, right. And so my vocal cords give me leverage, so my chest doesn't collapse. Okay. You watch a person with a tracheostomy. Right. Who cannot hold their breath. They can stop breathing, but they can't hold the breath because the trach tube is down lower than the vocal cords. They have a hard time lifting things. Mm -hmm. Now, um, if you're under a, in a lot of pain or for some reason everything is difficult to move, then you could put yourself into a, a situation where you could get Really? Really? Yeah. Um, or just inefficient voice use. Mm -hmm. And then you become used to doing it that way, and then you have to kind of break the habit and go back to the way you used to do it. I know it's kind of funny. Well, guys my age and girl, girl my age, uh, um, a lot of times when you get up out of a chair, and of course you sit here for three hours every morning, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know you're, you, 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 that is automatic. And even though I don't want to do that, it just comes out. Right. You know. Right. Yeah. That's that leverage thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's more important physiologically, you know. More important than speech, so it will happen first. It's, wow. You know, protective reflexes. If, if something flies at your face, you go ah, then you can't talk mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. because you're busy doing something to protect you. Right, right. That's how the brain is wired. Amazing. I learned so much today. I can't believe it. This is Thank interesting you. stuff. Um, welcome to the county. Welcome back. Thank you. And uh, of course, uh, a Madison resident uh, grew up in Madison. And uh, we used to have, I don't know if we still do it anymore, but we, our Connie football team and basketball team used to play Madison a lot. I don't know whether they still do anymore. They've got all kinds of changes in the leagues yeah, and stuff. Really sure. But uh, uh, I'm glad to have you back. And I hope you come back to the show again soon because uh, this kind of stuff, I'm sure um, we'll have open phone lines next time. And, and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of things that we didn't even cover today because cover a, variety, a wide variety of things uh, in your profession. But thanks so much, Bruce. I appreciate it. I'm sure. My pleasure.